Chapter 12 Anthony When I left the bathroom I went looking for Diana and Bindi and exited the building through the loading zone to have a smoke in the back. I found myself facing a sea of concrete under my feet as I walked around bathed in the arena lights that cast an unnatural yellow-orange tone onto everything. I breathed in the night air and just stood there for a moment, taking it all in, looking up at the sky to see past the glare of lights to an ethereal connection with eternity. There were two stars visibly twinkling in the far distance through a break in the clouds. Something undefinable brought my attention back to Earth, and I looked straight ahead to see Anthony walking my way. It felt surreal, and yet more real than ever before. I suddenly felt a bit small, fragile, and childlike, forgetting that I was, in fact, still a child, a woman child. I took a breath. This is it, I thought. I am going to meet him and suddenly wished that I didn't appear so plain in the ordinary green t-shirt as he approached. Hello, he said, as we were within touching distance. How are you on this beautiful summer night? He was right. It was early September, and there was still a taste of summer in the air, along with a surprising warmth for Frankfurt. The kindness extended by the goddess of summer did not go unappreciated by us. I opened my mouth to speak and suddenly felt the most intense case of shyness settling in on me, reminding me of when I was a little girl. As the electricity between us danced like lightning in the sky, I replied, Amazing. I raised my head up slowly to look at him from where I was staring at the ground like a wallflower gone wild, and looked directly into his eyes from under my lashes. He held my gaze with his own while his face lit up in a smile. And that was the moment when our two hearts reached out to each other as something surprisingly magical happened between us. I didn't know what else to say as though I was stricken with a silence affliction. I simultaneously had the realization of this peculiar state of being while the energy intensified between us. Still looking at me intently, his eyes appeared brown under the lights as he queried, Did you enjoy the show? Yes. I said, again staying with the one-word answers and unable to stop myself. I realized that he was beginning to feel a bit awkward, because the entire conversation was driven by his questions and my noticeably short answers. The intensity increased, as did the resounding silence, while he awaited any kind of sentence from me that entailed more than one word. He shook his long brown mane a little to the side and shifted his feet a bit. His body language indicated that he was feeling uncertain about how to proceed, and I knew that I had to say something, so I did. May I have your autograph? Slipped out and fell on the ground like loose change as I couldn't even believe that it had passed through my lips because I didn't want his autograph at all. If there was anything more cliché that I could say, I had no idea what it could be at that point. I wanted to get to know him, especially the softness that he evoked with his voice. He smiled and said that sure, I could have it. What's your name? he asked, as I peered at him through the keyhole inside the fortress of my own heart. Sherry, I replied. Sherry? Your name is Sherry? he asked, like a man stirred up, as his eyes widened and he did a double take. He was suddenly at rapt attention because of some internal cognizance, and looked off-center and a little startled by my name. Yes, Sherry, I said observing him closely, pretty sure that I still knew my own name. He looked slightly dazed for a moment, as if in a dream, as his eyes dilated wider, and he said, Hey, I know a girl named Sherry back home. You remind me of her. She looks a little bit like you, or you look a little bit like her. I'm not sure which. I nodded politely, curious as to why I brought something major up for him during our first few minutes of meeting each other. I found myself feeling more than relieved that he was having an unexpected personal epiphany that took his mind off the awkwardness of the moment. I don't have a pen. Do you have a pen? He asked, as he obviously pondered the synchronicity of my name. I almost always had a pen in my purse because I was a poet and lyricist, but I didn't mention that as I opened it, found a pen, and again gave a one-word answer. Yes. I spoke as I looked into his eyes and wondered if they were brown or hazel, because I couldn't quite tell in those lights given the size of his pupils. 
I handed him the pen and he asked me for something to sign. I gave him a blank look because I was completely unaccustomed to this little ritual. If I hadn't been feeling so self-conscious, it would have been hilarious that he had to prompt me. Do you have your ticket? He asked me. Yes, I said as I dug around, found it, and handed it to him. He signed it and gave me both the pen and the ticket back. I knew that if I didn't depart the conversation soon that I would drown in one-word answers. Thank you, I said softly and shyly. I should go find my friend Diana. I watched his response as his body tightened up a bit and he spoke suddenly to urge me to stay with him. Now, wait just a minute. Are you going to the party later? He asked. He was a fast talker. His words spilled out quickly and took me by surprise because his singing was so much slower, like thick, delicious syrup. Yes, I responded. Then I'll see you there, he said, looking very intently at me. Yes, I said again, in the worst case of shyness agony. It was obvious that he didn't want me to run off in search of Diana, and I didn't want to leave. However, I felt a real need to go and see him later after I had a chance to pull myself together and could speak more clearly. I felt like I needed to splash some cold water on my face and pat my cheeks, short of slapping myself to come back down to earth. I may as well have been on Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. So I looked up from the ground and smiled shyly at him summoning all my confidence as I walked away, looking back over my shoulder saying, I'll see you at the party. You can count on it, he said. I felt him watching me as I breathed a sigh of relief and began to have a little internal chat with myself. I knew that I couldn't be terribly shy on this night and that I needed to allow my heart to be not only seen but felt by those around me. I knew that I needed to relax and free myself to be myself without inhibition. I wanted to allow Anthony, Caesar, and these fascinating traveling gypsies to get to know the real me, not only the frustrated and angry girl that had her heart ripped to pieces by leaving New Orleans to move to Frankfurt two years ago. Instead, it was time to let my soul peer out from behind that wall so torturously built by the sweet girl whose heart was so tender that the only way to protect it was to keep it hidden, or so I thought. I didn't realize that people could see it in my eyes and written all over my face. The wall of anger and rage was there if anyone ventured too close, close enough to hurt it. That night, something came over me, the essence of my own spirit. A larger, more intricate part of me balanced on the delicate edge between heaven and earth. It kept me safe as it lived through me from within me. It was my connection to the infinite, my lifeline to God. This was the promise from the dream that I had of being over the world, playing on billowing white clouds and free from the earthly existence that I so often despised. The voice of wisdom echoed inside of me, reminding me that she would always be with me, and it was true. This part of me held Afsara in my arms, in the celestial wings of the stage as she wept, while hatred was being spewed below us through the mouths of ignorant intolerance. It was the part of me that commanded the Major to stop his assault and to leave me be. It was my deeper, compassionate heart and the strength of my own soul coming to the fore and answering the call to action. My larger destiny was imbued with a majestic tenderness of feeling, interwoven with the pastel luminous hues of love and the foundational binding strength of grace. I kept it just enough out of my own reach so as not to overwhelm the 16-year-old girl hanging out with her favorite band. This 16-year-old girl, whether I liked it or not, was about to become a young woman, not through acquiescence, but by standing her ground.